Lord Jesus, your word truly is the entrance of light to our heart. And please, God, like a million candle watt bulb, the darkest depths of our heart need light. Things that we've kept from you, things that we've really even kept from ourselves, God, the stuff we're afraid to tell anybody. We don't even admit to ourselves that they're there. God, that's the stuff we want gone. For those of us that don't have strength to overcome our sin, God, please, may your word strengthen us. May your spirit illuminate your word today. May, um, may my words be few and your words be abundant. We ask these things so that we know your complete plan for our lives. Amen. Meta tauta. Meta tauta. After these things. Six months go by between chapter 6 and chapter 7. It is now six months from the cross. It's a year and a half has passed since Nicodemus came to the Lord at night. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was at hand. Please give me attention. You that are new, I know we have some visitors here. When you see that word Jews there, there is a very, very false accusation by some well-intended in the church to think that means Jewish people. That is not what it means. That is the leadership of religious and political affiliation. That does not mean Jews. For having hindsight being 2020, we don't understand to now. Back then, all that followed him was Jews. They were all Jews, Israelites, children of Abraham. So when we see, especially in the, in the book of John, there's actually a, a word. This word does not mean Jewish folk, Jewish people. This is the leadership of the Jews. And anybody who has taken New Testament scripture to mean in any anti-Semitic way, shame on us, shame on you, because our Lord Jesus was, is, and always will be a Jew. You serve a Jewish Savior. Don't ever, ever forget that. Please. Very, very important. Growing up Italian Catholic, again, with that mindset in my neighborhood, it was always portrayed as Mazza de Cristo, the killer of Christ in Italian, we called him. And we know that um, as Christians, our closest allies are Jews. Don't ever, ever lose that. The Feast of Tabernacles. Now, there were six feasts in Israel. They were, they were, one was at the beginning, the first month of the year. I'm sorry, three were at the beginning, three were at the end. The Passover feast were the three feasts. Now, for a home study, if you want, we have a long way to go, so I don't want to go through all of them today. However, each feast not only is a representation, a type, or a picture of a different event in Christ's life, it is so beautiful as a, as a, as a born-again Jew to study these feasts and remember Purim and, and the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of, of Weeks. It is so beautiful to go through these things and see how each one of them represents a different part of not only your relationship with the Lord, but how the Jews would come to know Him in future times. It's it's an amazing study, and again, my suggestion is Chuck Smith or Chuck Missler on YouTube. You can look up Feast of, Te Feast of the Jews. Now, the Feast of Tabernacles is interesting, and for us, it really is important. I think the Lord just gave us, just a couple months ago, kind of a Feast of Tabernacles here in uh, South Florida. If you don't know the history of the Jews, the Jews were slaves for 400 years in Egypt, and this man named Moses called by God, who was also a Jew, a slave. He was raised in Pharaoh's house. One day he looked out over his people and he said, this ain't right. People shouldn't be slaves. So he sought God and God used him to set the people free. And for 40 years, the Jews wandered in the wilderness until they came to the promised land. And when they came to that promised land, in Deuteronomy chapter 7 and 8, the Lord says, listen, I don't ever want you to forget where you came from. 
So I want you to celebrate this thing called the Feast of Tabernacles. Tabernacles sounds just like it is. It's literally a tent. It's a two-sided tent, intentionally left open on the sides so that the wind can go through it. And there's a beautiful picture of the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of Christ. But again, study that. If you're a Bible geek like me, it's such a beautiful study. However, we just had that, didn't we? We had that little hurricane. My family, we didn't have power for about seven or eight days. And it was <laughs> It was like 98 degrees in the house. I mean, it was, there were smells coming out of my body that I was just like, wow. Probably should have left that part out. My daughter Arlie's a trooper. She stuck with me almost the whole time. My wife took the other kids and went up to my in-law's house where there's power. Don't blame her for that. But kind of remember where you came from. Please don't ever forget where you came from. Don't ever forget what it's like. I've used this analogy often. And if you're there now, please know that it's not going to last forever. But if you're on your way somewhere else, don't ever forget the lean years. I remember when I first moved down to Florida, it was in 1988, I had a 73 Monte Carlo. It was uh, painted red. If you guys were here last week, I told you about this. My, my grandfather painted it red with a brush. <laughs> it used to be white and then... The car was all I had. I had to sleep in it. I lived in it. And then I stayed at my grandmother's house, and I wore out my welcome there because I was such a pleasant fellow. I went and stayed with my aunt, my cousin, Peppy, and wore out my welcome there, and back to my car, and that's where I was. My mom, she would send me 20 bucks, 30 bucks when she had it, but times were lean. I remember going, I found this gas station up in Boynton. I, was, I, got, I finally got a job working in Boynton, and there was a gas station up there, and when you um, finished pumping the gas, the gas would still just kind of trickle out, like a, a little dribble. And I was like, wow. Even though the thing stopped, the gas was still coming out, so I just would leave it in there, I'd sit there, I'd be there for an hour, and it would give you an extra quarter, half gallon of gas. I remember pulling over and getting gas, and, and having like change, you know, two dollars and two dollars and thirty-five cents regular, please. The cheap stuff, please. Remember buying the um, ten for a dollar, ramen noodles, baby. We used to make this stuff called poor man's pasta. Me and my cousin, me and my cousin Aaron, were living together, and we used to make a pot at the beginning of the week. We take two or three pounds of spaghetti, put it in there, and leave the water in the bottom of the pot. And that's what we'd eat every morning. We'd take some of that, put it on the plate. Don't ever forget where you came from. God gave the Jews the Feast of Tabernacles. As soon as God gives you a little consistency, gives you a little steadiness, and you get a nice paycheck, and maybe, maybe you don't have to worry about where the rent's going to come from next month. Thank God for that. Don't ever forget where you came from. This is a mandate. This is a mandate that God gave to the Jews. Don't ever forget where you came from. Because the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Don't ever forget. If, if you've got money now to, to buy food, thank God for that. Because God's not going to be any less good in another couple of years if you don't have any food. He's still good all the time, right? Continuing. The Feast of Tabernacles was at hand, verse 3. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. Please give me your attention. His brothers, now in case you are from a Catholic background, the Lord Jesus had four brothers. Two of them wind up after his resurrection getting saved and being a very big part of the church. Uh, it's very well documented in Scripture that although as Catholics we believe that Mary was a virgin all her life, that Scripture doesn't bear witness to that, not... Um, not that not believing that would, would change your position of salvation. Please, if you come from a more traditional Catholic background and you want to believe that Mary was a virgin and never touched by her husband Joseph, that's fine. It's not going to change who the Lord is. But that doesn't bear witness to Scripture. However, his brothers... Now, if you want to do another really cool study, again, I'm not going to turn it today. We've studied this in the past. Read Psalm 69 and see what it was like David, speaking under the influence of the Holy Spirit, spoke of the Lord's upbringing, how his brothers hated him. He was a stranger in his own house. That um, They got sick of the perfect kid. Oh, he's the older brother. Everybody loves Jesus. 
Yeshua, they, they hated his guts. And that's not, I'm not hy using hyperbole there. Psalm 69 will bear that out in other places in scripture where he was mocked because his mother was actually called a prostitute because she had a child out of wedlock. And it, growing up being the Lord was, uh, I bet a lot of you guys can relate to that. I bet, you know, single moms could understand a lot more about um, raising their child from studying the life of Mary than you could imagine. However, his brothers, when he started his ministry, now being two and a half years into his ministry, them still not understanding it. Remember we talked about the whole David Blaine thing. There were so many people who just ignored the whole miracle thing that he did, the breaking of the bread and, and the healing of the people. They just thought it was all, you know, a, an illusion. It's all make-believe. And his brother's like, dude, you got to go back to Judea. If you don't go back to Judea, how's everybody going to follow you? See, his brothers had this false assumption that bigger is better. They had this false assumption that if God's in it, there's going to be a lot of people following it. It's a poison in our churches these days. This is why the Bible calls this the age of apostasy. Fully and truly believing that more is God, less is not God. Your ministry is truly successful if a lot of people are coming to it, and unsuccessful if less people are coming to it. Nothing, biblically speaking, could be further from the truth. Matter of fact, some of the most successful preachers in the Bible had nobody following them. As a matter of fact, there's a guy named Jeremiah. You ever hear his name? 50 years preaching. Guess how many converts he had? Zero. None. Not one. He was a crybaby, too. They called him the weeping prophet. He was always crying about one thing or another. Don't ever think that the way must be shared with a lot. It's just here and watch. Now you can be saying, oh, I don't know, I think you're adding that to it. Am I? Okay. Verse 4 again. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. Look at verse 5. For even his brothers did not believe in him. I wasn't making that up. Then Jesus said to them, speaking to his brothers, My time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not yet going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Now, real quick, biblically speaking, it almost seems like he tells a little white lie there because he says, I'm not going up to the feast, but then he winds up going to the feast, as we're about to see. That is not what happened. A lot of people wrongly use this to justify white lies or little lies. The very specific Greek word that he says there, the reason he says, I am not yet going up, there's actually four words, but there are only two in the Greek, and it meant, I'm not going up now or yet. That's why that yet is added for continuity. Do you understand what I'm saying? So please understand that the confirmation of lying is not in, in Scripture. You're not going to find that. And um, we can talk about that another day if, if you want. Um, but he kind of lays into them. He says, listen, I know. <laughs> Guys, if, you, if, you, if you're new to this life, this Christian life, and all of a sudden you can't figure out why um, people who once were your friends now hate your guts, if you can't figure out why all of a sudden your family just doesn't get you, they don't understand, and, you, and your friends, they want you back with them, you're not alone here. They did the same thing to the disciples. They did the same thing to the apostles. They did the same thing to our Lord. Come on. Cut it out. We know it's all make-believe. I've said this a hundred times, and I'm probably going to say it a thousand more before our ministry is over. Who you are here, guys, when the Spirit is upon you, that's who you are. Who you're out there when the world's Spirit is upon you, that's not who you are. That's who the world wants you to be. So when your friends that see you out there, they come to church and maybe you're raising your hands or maybe you're talking, and it's kind of a weird thing. If you've ever had your worlds collide, it's kind of a crazy thing. You can be talking to a Christian friend of yours from church and your whole demeanor and tone is different. Then all of a sudden you bump into somebody you know from work or the world and it's like, I remember, who, who am I supposed to be? Who am I supposed to be? Man, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a faker. I don't, I don't want to do this. I want to be real. Well, then you should let your light that shines in you when the Spirit is upon you 
start to infect and to saturate all who you are, even when you're at work, even when you're at home. But it's so hard. Yes, it is. And here the Lord makes it clear. The world doesn't, doesn't hate the world. The world hates you. And it's never going to be easy, guys. It's a struggle. I'm, I'm walking with the Lord now 25 years, and it's still a struggle. You know, I just sometimes just want to hang out and be a regular guy. I just want to hang out at the gym and, and talk, and, and, and you all of a sudden you find yourself crossing that line in between chatting and, and chatting, and you're like, man, man, come back, come back, come back, come back. You ain't alone in there. And I don't care whether you're in high school, junior high school. Remember, who you are here when the Spirit is upon you, that's the real you. So when your friends say, oh, please cut it out. We know who you really are. No, you don't. Because who I really am is when I'm here and the Spirit falls upon me and I'm around my friends and family. People who want you to go and hang out at the clubs and drink. and Man, it's so crazy. I knew girls in my old neighborhood that would make their friends smoke cigarettes. They would say, oh, come on, smoke, just smoke. I just want to watch you smoke a cigarette one time. I understand that. Just because they want you to be like them. If I'm going to ruin my life, you've got to ruin your life with me. I don't want to be alone in this. Isn't that crazy? Does anybody know what I'm talking about there? Or are you guys like cross-eyed at me now? Okay, good. Continuing. When he said these things, he remained in Galilee. But when his brothers had gone up, then he also went up to the feast, not openly, but as it were in secret. Then the Jews, again, the leadership, sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much complaining among the people concerning him. Some said he is good. Others said, No, on the contrary, he deceives the people. However, no one spoke openly of him for fear of the Jews. That is what you call the, the beginning of political correctness. When you are afraid to think and feel what you think and feel because you don't want people who might not agree with you, to be offended. In this day and age, political correctness is destroying our society. Where now, you can't even disagree with someone's personal viewpoint on a situation. Well, you know, I like Trump. You like Trump? Yeah, I like Hillary. You like Hillary? Are you like, I, I, I'm pro-life. I'm pro I, It's not just, oh, wow, that's crazy. I didn't know. What's your point of view on that? You know, there's, a, um, there's this guy, um, I don't know if I suggest everybody looking it up, but if you can handle it. There's a guy named uh, Crowder, um, Stephen Crowder. He's got a, a YouTube channel called Louder with Crowder. And he's got this really cool thing that he does. There's a series of videos he puts out, and it, it says, I'm this, change my mind. And he literally goes to universities, these liberal universities, and he says, he has a sign that says, I'm pro-gun, change my mind. And he sits down and he invites people, can we just have a conversation? No screaming, no, just a friendly debate. The, the last one he put out the other day was, I'm pro-life, change my mind. And these people sit down and these college students go, just change my mind. Tell me why you are what you are and I'll tell you why. Just a conversation. And, and the, the whole idea of it is, it's so, it's so good because these exchange of ideas go back and forth and it's in a, in a, uh, um, it's in a setting that's safe and nobody is, is bullied. And, and he's a smart dude, so he kind of usually shreds their arguments. So it's really interesting from our perspective, if you are um, more of a conservative Christian type. Um, you got it. Verse 14. Now about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? Please, for a pastor, if you are a pastor, if you are thinking about being a pastor, if you ever have dreams about being a pastor, understand this. The person that you see standing up here is not the person that is out there. That doesn't mean I'm a hypocrite, but here's what happens. I stand up here having spent all week studying, having spent all week praying, having spent all week reading, and God does what's called an anointing. He gives me an understanding of his word. I don't know how I know what I know. And what we do in church circles is we have to somehow make this materialize into logic. So if I come up here and I say, hey guys, I want you to know that I graduated Kuma Samladi. I um, went to cemetery, uh, seminary school. 
I, um, I have a doctorate in theology. And you guys go, oh, okay, okay, now you can teach me. But what if I come up here and tell you the truth? Guys, I, I graduated high school six months late. I did graduate high school, though. What was your GPA? Not good. Well, what else did you do? I went to prison. I did do Bible college classes while I was in prison. Yeah, see, they're leaving. I don't blame them. See you guys later. She's pregnant, guys, six months. You believe that girl's pregnant six months? Look at her. See you later, Maddie. Have a good day, guys. Ciao, ciao. So if I tell you that, there are some that would be, oh, I can't learn nothing from this guy, but listen to me. When the Spirit has called you to do something, the Spirit enables and empowers you to do it. I don't know how I know what I know. I just know when the Spirit is upon me, somehow while I'm reading and while I'm studying, he puts all these, uh, like if I'm praying for you and I and my your version, you go, oh my goodness, I just read that this morning. I don't know how that happens. And I don't want to make believe in anything that's anything about me. But I also want anybody that's here, and if you're thinking about studying, uh, you're thinking about teaching the, the children's ministry, and the first thing you say is, I don't know how to teach the Bible. Listen, don't worry about it. God will give you the words. Don't even worry about it. You want to help the kids? We need help. Right, Johnny? Come on. God will give you. And people will look at you and go, how does he know the things that he knows, having never studied? How do you know these? How do you teach the Bible without only going to high school and never going to seminary school? You know, the great thing about Calvary Chapel movement is it truly brings to life the word of God, which says, behold, I make all things new. Where losers like me and Austin and Tanner, we can become pastors. Craig, Matt, we can become people of God, for sure, Dean. God can take your life, change it, and use you. If God can use losers like Tom, <laughs> what can he do with your life? I ask you that question. Verse 15 again, and the Jews marveled, the leaders marveled. How does this man know letters, having never studied? Jesus answered and said to them, My doctrine is not mine, but he who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it is from God or whether I speak in my own authority. And there's an amazing confirmation there, guys. Just that statement, that's a real big memory verse. Let a Christian come and sit before you. Let them come here. If they doubt my veracity as a teacher of God's word, sit there. And if you're of God, you'll know whether my doctrine is of God or not. And that's what he's saying to these leaders. If you were really from God, you wouldn't worry about where I came from, what I did. All you would know is you're receiving the word of God. You're seeing the works of God. Do you understand the implication here, what the Lord is saying to them? If you were of God, you'd know I'm of God. But you're not of God. That's why you think I'm not of God. And that is extremely, extremely important from a, a, an application standpoint. Uh, verse 18, he who speaks from himself seeks his own glory. Woo That's dangerous. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is true, and no unrighteousness in him, is in him. Did not Moses give you the law? Let none of you keep the law. What do you, but why do you seek to kill me? Guys, this is probably the craziest thing you're going to see in all scripture. He looks at these religious leaders, these keepers of the law, and he says to them, first of all, quoting Moses, and then he says, not that it was from the Moses, but the fathers. He said, Moses gave you the law, and you don't keep the law. Why do you look to kill me? He's telling these people, it would be tandem to somebody coming to this place and get, you guys call yourselves Christians? Excuse me? You guys ever have that? Somebody in the world say that to you? You call yourself a Christian? Oh, I didn't know Christians do that. It's a lot of stuff you don't know about Christians, apparently. 
Let's leave that one alone for now. The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses therefore gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Let me tell you something. We could spend three weeks studying that little section of Scripture from 21 to 24. Let me explain to you, please, what he says here. Ready? First, I'm going to give you the answer, and then I'm going to take the trail. Here's what he's saying. Some law is more important than other law. Some scriptures are more important than other scriptures. Some things to follow are more important than other things to follow. Now, that might open up this little door in your mind and go, whoa, 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 what does that mean? You, the Bible is supposed to be perfect. The Bible is supposed to be accurate. The Bible is supposed to be uncontradicting. That's what you tell me. The Bible is immutable, unchangeable. You're supposed to do that. Now, wait, you just said now some things are more important than others. That means it's not, yes, you can do that. But here's what the Lord said to those that keep the law. He says, what day are you supposed to uh, circumcise a child? Anybody? The eighth day you're supposed to circumcise a child. Now, completely separate from the Bible study, the eighth day is such a scientific miracle. It is the same day that the human body produces uh, a clotting factor. Uh, to circumcise a child on the eighth day, scientifically speaking, medically speaking, is absolutely the best day to do it. How did Moses know that? But let's go back to that other thing a second. Just look that up for homework yourself if you're interest, interested in, in why God is the God outside of time and science and he is the God of all things. However, he says if you're supposed to circumcise a child on the eighth day, well, what if the eighth day falls on a Saturday and it's the Sabbath? And the Sabbath says don't work. What are you supposed to do then? Well, of course you circumcise a child on the eighth day. Why? Um, well, because I'd be, breaking, I'd be breaking the Sabbath, but I'd be keeping the law. Well, tell me, where is the Sabbath in the law? The Sabbath predates the law. The Lord created the heaven and earth in six days and the seventh day rested. The Sabbath predates circumcision. So I, I'm confused. You're confusing me, yes. And there is confusion here. Because to do good on any day in the eyes of God is good. Do you understand that? He says to them, oh, you really want to play scripture games with me? You ever have anybody in the world start quoting scripture? You, oh, yeah, well, why does the Bible say such a... It's like, do you really want to do that? You know the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Do you know what that means? That means the side that you grab it might be the very side that's cutting you open. Be careful. The devil tried to do that with the Lord in the wilderness. Do you remember? He said to him, it is written. Jump. The psalm writer said, jump, and you won't even dash your feet against the stone. And the Lord looked at him and said, it is also written. You shall not test the Lord your God. So standing on a promise of a false word or a premise in the word that you're applying wrongly is not near as important as holding fast to something that honors and glorifies God in a way of obedience. Are you understanding this? What he said to these religious leaders, do you know how many people argue scripture and it's what the Lord called straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. When somebody wants to tell you, oh, you know, I heard you're not supposed to buy a Mercedes if you're a Christian. Well, now you're going to look under my fingernails? I heard you're not supposed to... You know, if you weren't living with your girlfriend and selling coke on the side you probably shouldn't judge me for maybe driving a car that you don't agree with. Straining a gnat and swallowing a camel. 
You know, the Bible says this, and guys, hold on to this verse. Let this fall over you now like a warm breeze. You ready? It's his kindness that leads to repentance. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Who doesn't look at our sin and go, what are you, what are you doing? It's, it's, it's the kindness of God who looks and says, you can do that, and I'll forgive you, and I will be with you through everything you do. That's the type of person who you want to turn around to and go, are you really going to forgive me? Absolutely. That's the type of God that we serve, whose kindness leads us to repentance, not judgment. Mercy triumphs over judgment. His mercy is what changes us, not his judgment. And here the Lord Jesus is trying to explain this to them. You're trying to kill me, and yet you call yourself a Jew? You're breaking the law of Moses. Oh, well, no, we're not. No, we're not. We don't break the law of Moses. Really? You circumcise on the eighth day, do you? Yeah? Well, what if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath? That's when the true, oh yeah, well, blah, 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 asterisk, exclamation point. <laughs> Guys, please remember that in the society, this wasn't no joke. They weren't trying to kill Jesus. They were trying to murder him. If somebody tells you, hey, next time you go to Deerfield, you're dead, okay? I see you in Deerfield, you're dead. I will shoot you down. Yeah, this is not just backyard trash talk. Oh, I'll beat you with one hand. Talk. They were going to kill him. And bravely, he went to the feast anyway and said, I don't stop doing what I do because some threat. God, God will protect me or I'll die in God. It's pretty heavy stuff. Continuing. Remember, there's holier choices in the law. I just want you guys to remember that. There's holier choices in Christ. Verse 25. Now, some of them from Jerusalem said, Is not this he whom they seek to kill? They all knew they were trying to kill him. But look, he speaks boldly, and they say nothing to him. Do the rulers know indeed that this is truly the Christ? However, we know where this man is from. But when the Christ comes, no one will know where he is from. Hmm. When then Christ cried out, as he taught in the temple, saying, You both know me, and you know where I am from. I have not come from myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him, for I am from him, and he sent me. Doesn't this guy know if he keeps talking like that, nobody's going to come to his church doesn't he know unless he's nice to people, people won't show up? You're not going to build a church being rude like that to people, telling them they don't know God. Hey, you guys, none of you know God. I know God. I know I know God. I don't know if you know God or not. And I look at some of your lives, you obviously don't know God. See you next week. Lord wasn't afraid of that. You know what he was afraid of? Here's what he was afraid of, what every pastor should be afraid of, that somebody leaves here thinking they're okay with God when they're not. I'd rather have you think you're not okay with God when you are than not okay with God when you're not. Do you understand that? What a, did I say that wrong? Always do that, man. What would I do without a wife and a daughter? Man, I'm an idiot. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> my mommy does my laundry. <laughs> she lives in my house. She better. I don't bring it to her house. Therefore, they sought to take him. Now, you remember, if you remember, I told you guys, when the Pharisees, when the religious leaders are mad at the Lord and we don't see why, we need to really reassess. No, wait a second. Why were they mad at him? Maybe I missed something. And here, right after he said that to them, 
They, they well, we're going to get you now. We're going to, that's, I can't, you, did you just say that to us? We keep the law. You're the, you're the bastard here. Now, for you younger kids that don't understand that word bastard, that is a technical term meaning one who doesn't have a father, one who is born out of wedlock. And that is what they called him because his mother had a baby before she was married. And it was kind of well known in the town. So I didn't mean as a cuss, more as a technical term. Therefore they sought to take him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. And I love the, the, the mystery there is when, when it's time, when it's your time, it's your time. If it's not your time, God's not going to let it be your time. Period. My brother Cliff got hit by a car a couple of years ago. Shouldn't be here. Wasn't his time. It wasn't his time. It wasn't his time. When your time comes, don't matter. Your time's up. If it's not, until then, in the power of God, you're supernatural. And the Lord Jesus knew that. There's a wonderful, wonderful thing there. Verse 31. And many of the people believed in him and said, When Christ comes, will he do more signs than these which this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning him. And the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. Then Jesus said to them, I shall be with you a little while longer. And then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Please, let me, let me explain this to you. I want you to see this. I want you to visualize this. So they try to take him, but they don't. For his hour has not yet come. So they go away, can't grab him. And they say, listen, they tell the cops who are on their payroll, I want you to go grab that guy. I want you to bring him here. Dead or alive, I want him, I want him here now. So they go to him, you know, whatever they have, spears, and they... And they and he, we, we have to take you. And he looks at them and he says to them, I shall be with you a little while longer. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. Have you ever gone to church? Or maybe you're here today and the things that I'm saying, they're just slaughtering your insides. You're just, turn, inside, you're just turned upside down. Sometimes you want to cry. Last week we had a real tearjerker story about my dog. And What is that? Why does that not happen out there? Why all of a sudden in here you hear, is there something? And you look to me maybe. You might even look at me and go, wow, when that guy talks, it ain't me. I'm reading you the Bible and explaining to you what it means. That's what I do. I read the Bible, explain the Bible. Read the Bible, explain the Bible. These aren't my messages. These aren't my words. These are his words. And when you hear the word, especially for the first time, I remember reading the Bible the first time and going, my goodness, I'm in trouble with God. <laughs> I'm in big trouble. Watch what happens here. This is why I set that up. Then the Jews said among themselves, where does he intend to go that we shall not find him? Does he intend to go into dispersion among the Greeks, meaning those are the, the Jews that were not living in Jerusalem, which is extremely prophetic, extremely prophetic when the apostles go out there, but let's not pay attention to that right now. What is this thing that he said, you will seek me and not find me, or where I am, go I am you cannot come? On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Please, before we read the prophetic verse of 39, the last day of the feast was kind of the day you really whooped it up. It's usually a seven or a 14 day feast, depending on what was the decision. This was a seven day feast. That's the day you're filled. You ever go to a, a how many of you guys like barbecues? You go to barbecue, you have one of those family barbecues or family get-together. Imagine seven days of it. The last day of the feast, somebody goes, Anybody thirsty? Still hung over from yesterday. Nope. There's some more barbecue. Done with the barbecue. He gets up on the last day of the feast and he says, Are you thirsty? Here's what he's saying. Okay, you had enough. Are you thirsty now? 
And I don't have to tell you that he's talking about spiritual thirst. You know exactly what he means. Isn't that crazy? Are you thirsty? No, I, I got my water right here. Are you thirsty? The psalm writer wrote, like a deer panteth for water, so my soul longeth after you. Are you thirsty? Look at verse 39, I love it. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Again, just briefly, I want to get to the end of this thing. We've been going a while. The Holy Spirit could not be poured out upon the people until the Lord Jesus was glorified, risen from the dead. So in Acts 2, he breathes on them and they receive the Spirit. Not the Spirit of salvation, but the baptism of the Spirit for service. You understand what I'm saying, guys? This is extremely important. If you are not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to seek it. You need to ask for it. It's, it's not going to happen by magic. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen unless you ask for it. Luke 11, 11, you can look up chapter of Luke and see. If you are in Christ and yet having a hard time walking the walk, it's probably because you have not received the baptism of the Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Old Testament Hebrews, the Spirit would come upon them. Samson, the Spirit would come upon him. Elijah, the Spirit would come upon. All these men, the Spirit would come upon, but would not indwell. Para, in to stay forever, never leaving. This is is the spirit of baptism that he promises. Continuing, think about that one on your free time. Uh, verse 40. Therefore many from the crowd, when they heard this saying, said, truly, this is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, will Christ come out of Galilee? Has not scripture said that the Christ comes from the seed of David and from the town of Bethlehem? Where David was, now we know he came from Bethlehem. So they were right. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now some of them wanted to take him, but no one laid hands on him. Then the officers came. Four days later, they came back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who said to them, Why have you not brought him? Where is he? The officer said, No man ever spoke like this. He said these Things to me that changed. I told you, I paid you to go get him. To get him and to... You come here and you think you're going to cut God's... You come here, some, you invite your family, you, invite your, you, bring, you drag your kid out here and they think, oh, I'll just sit there and I'll, I'll argue, I'll tell that pastor where it's at. Uh, I don't fall for that. I'm smart. And all of a sudden the word of God goes forward, not the pastor's word, the word of God goes forward no man ever spoke like that. Now you can do one or two things to that. You could either pull your heart the rest of the way open and receive the Spirit and be changed. Or you can harden your heart and go, I hate that guy. I hate him and I hate you and I'm never going to church again. Why? They hate me. Who hates you? I'm gay or, or I smoke pot or I'm this or I'm that and they hate me. Nobody hates you. Who told you that? Nobody hates gay people here. Anybody here hate gay people? Anybody here hate people who smoke pot? Anybody hate people? Nobody. Where did he get this from? Because they can't just open their heart. Nobody ever spoke like this before. You've never had this. You've never heard the word of God being preached before without apology. Just, Come on, take it in. Never heard anybody speak like this before. The officers, I, 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 we couldn't. No. No man ever spoke like this. Then the Pharisees answered them, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Now notice they couldn't say that in front of the Lord because we just established that they couldn't keep the law themselves. But let's not talk about unpleasant things. Look at verse 50. Here's where we close. Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night. And again, remember, this is a year and a half ago. Chapter 3 was a year and a half before this. We know by counting the feasts, this is not conjecture. This is a year and a half ago. Who came to him by night, being one of them, said to them, Does our Lord judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? He says to them, 
Do you see any of the leaders of the Pharisees following him? Obviously, we know. We know because we're special. We don't follow him because he's not the Christ. Nicodemus says, um, I'm one of them. They had the opportunity. You ever have somebody in your family that gave their heart to the Lord? And the Lord knocks on your heart and says, come on, come do this together with them. Now we know that Nicodemus is one of them because him and Joseph of Arimathea, the one that took the Lord's body off the cross and buried it. And then lastly, they answered, I love it, now it's not the Jews, now it's they. And I, I, it freaks me out. Verse 52, the first two words in, 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 the first word in 52 freaks me out, they. Who's they? Do you ever wonder who makes these decisions? Who came up with this? Who is they? How does YouTube, uh, Twitter, who sits at the top of these social media? They. Uh, Facebook. Who sits at the, and makes these decisions? Who decided these, who's they? It's never anybody. You never, can we talk to the person that did this? No. Who made this decision? If you ever have eBay, you ever, you ever have a problem with eBay? Anybody selling anything off of eBay? And then all of a sudden they close your account down. Can I talk to whoever's responsible? No. Well, who made this decision? Computer. It's an uh, algorithm. Could I speak to algorithm, please? <laughs> who is they? Who is it that wanted to kill the Lord? And what was the real reason? Well, the real reason was they were jealous because the people were following him. They were being set free from their sin. And the more people were wicked and foul and filthy, the more they followed the Pharisees and gave them money and power and influence. But who made the decision? It was an algorithm. It was all of us getting together. But who made the decision? They. Who's they? They's on first. Who? That's third base. Now, I say that in a jest, but it's so true. Th does anybody know what I'm saying? Who made this decision? Who decided that this was the way it was supposed to be? They did. They answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look. No prophet has arisen out of Galilee. And everyone went to his own house. Okay, let me explain to you what this is, and this is where we can close. He says to them, no prophet comes out of Galilee. That's wrong. Amos came from Galilee. Elisha came from Galilee. Elijah came from Galilee. A lot of prophets came from Galilee. So when all else fails, lie. He can't be the Christ. Why? Because no prophet comes from Galilee. Oh, and here's what happens. Ready, kids? Young kids, junior high school, high school, college kids, you have teachers who teach you lies. And because you're not ready to hear lies, you believe it. Because you're not studying the Word of God, because you're not spending time with the Word of God, you're counting on your parents' relationship with God to get you through. These people come, they tell you lies. And you believe it because they have authority over you, because they say it with conviction. I'm telling you the truth. This is what the Word of God says. And this is what the Pharisees, this is what they do. And you can find out. My daughter, when she was going through college, when she was at FAU, she came home one day and she threw this little book on the table. She goes, Dad, look at this. What is it? Read page 43. Oh, whoa! Oral sex and ejaculation. Get that school on the phone. Hey, you give my kid pornography to read? Are you out of your mind? I'm sorry. Do you want to take your daughter out of school and put her in a Christian school? I wonder who made this decision. They made this decision. Who decided that this was the book? This is the book that, that's part of our curriculum. Who made the curriculum? They did. Who's they? I want to talk to them. Ask her if I'm lying. Call them up on the phone. What you need to do. Oh, here's the great. This is the best part. They wouldn't talk to me. Um, excuse me, your daughter's an adult. She's, 20, she's 19 years old, 20 years old. We don't talk to parents. So angry. What you need to do is take your daughter out of the school and put her in a Christian school. 
Why? Because I don't want her to learn about sexual. They made this decision and they lied to her. And thank God that my daughter knew the truth and she was free. But I worry about you kids that are in here that don't know the truth. And you come to church every week because you're, gra- you're drugged to church. But you don't know the word of God and you don't know the power of God. And if you don't know the word of God and you don't know the power of God, you will fall for the world and all its lies. Because the world is sweet. It tastes good. It really does for a season. And then all of a sudden you don't realize that you're tied up and you're pregnant and you're stuck. Or you just make believe you don't have any babies. Like, like so many men in with a ghetto mentality, do I don't have no kids. Man, and that's what's killing our generation. These Pharisees looked at the people, and you know what the people did? It didn't say they rose up and attacked. It didn't say they rose up and said, look at the last line, the scariest line in the Bible. And everyone went to his own house. He's not the Christ. What are you talking about? Why? Does any prophets come from Galilee? Oh. Okay. Excuse me, um, Amos came from Galilee, um, Obadiah came from Galilee. Uh, I didn't know that. I know you don't know that. And that's why they get you while you're in college and they feed you lies. And now all of a sudden you go back and you tell your parents, oh, you don't know what you're talking about because this, that, and the other thing. Whoa, whoa. Where did you learn this stuff? They taught me. I want to talk to that teacher of yours. They won't talk to you. Yeah, they don't like to talk to people who are smart. They only like to talk to people who are ignorant and foolish. And when I use the word ignorant, I mean unknowledgeable. You see, this is a generation. It's full of information and lacks wisdom. It's full of knowledge and lacks smarts. Whether you figure it out now or you figure it out later, this is all you need to succeed in life. In business, in marriage, in school, everything that you need is right here. (sighs) Okay, I'm done. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word and ask you, please, that may your word stick to our hearts. I pray for every person that's here, especially the kids. I feel so burdened for these college kids now, God, that they would have a real and true relationship with you and not be um, deceived by they. And I pray against the spirit of lies that the Pharisees brought. And I pray by your power and by your spirit, all the things that your word went forth to say to people's hearts today would come to pass. Bless us, Lord Jesus. May our lives be changed because you are our life. And I do pray for any person that's here right now, and they might not be here next week, or they might not be here the week after. They might never come to a church again. God, I do pray that that one person that's here that is curious, they would open their heart right now and just say, yes, Lord. They would just receive you in their heart now, and you begin that good work, God. You begin that good work. God, may their hearts right now say, yes, Lord, I am thirsty. Yes, Lord, receive the Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, for the opportunity to share your word. Give me another day. I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you guys.